really inspired to talk today by an interaction I had on Friday. Uh, some of you know I help uh, operate this shower program. We bring a big giant mobile shower trip to communities uh, of unsheltered folks so that they can grab a shower and some other gene service. And uh, so I was there on Friday downtown here in Diego. And there's this woman who is a volunteer and about, you know, she started about a year or so ago. And for a while she was coming almost every time we came downtown. And, uh, and then for various reasons, she had to stop volunteering, but then she came again on Friday and she's just the most lovable person. <laughs> Uh, just always full of positive energy and just the most kind, compassionate, energetic, loving, attentive person ever. She's a nurse uh, in the ER and uh, just such a wonderful person. And I was so happy to see her on Friday. She just, you know, always, you know, in addition to just being happy when we get more volunteers because it helps make the, the work easier. It was just so nice to see her. And so we started the program and we're cleaning showers and we're running the thing and we're catching up and, and talking. And uh, she says, you know, yeah, you know, about a few months ago, I, I almost lost my job. And I said, oh no, what happened? And she said, well, and keep in mind, she's a nurse at a big hospital here in San Diego. And she said, well, I'm really uh, hesitant about the vaccines. And so I won't get a vaccine. And they told me that, uh, you know, I might lose my job because I won't get the vaccine. And she ended up getting an exemption from her work. Uh, so she still is unvaccinated. And I just felt my heart sink. Uh, this real gut immediate reaction that I've developed over the, this past year or so. Um, and just this flood of emotions like, oh my God, this favorite person of mine is now on the evil team. And I just couldn't believe it with all the compassion and all the love and all of the thoughtfulness that I know this person has, that she would be an anti-vaxxer. And so I just kind of, because I care so much about her and because we had enough volunteers that I could stay with her on that side of the trailer and talk with her, I really kind of wanted to dig in and have that conversation and just see where she was coming from. And, you know, I know we've all had these conversations with people in our lives. Um, I personally am a strong believer in the vaccine. And I think it's a public service to get the vaccine. And so I just really trusted my um, feelings for this person and our relationship enough to go into it. And I'll kind of, as we go forward, I'll talk about what actually happened in the conversation more. But basically, we went into it for about 15, 20 minutes. And it ended up being the best interaction I've had with an anti-vaxxer, non-believer, whatever. She, you know, she knows COVID is real. She sees it every day. But it was just, it ended up being the so far in my experience the best possible interaction I had with someone around this particular topic and so it was just really notable you know it just ended with um, thank you for sharing and please come to me if you have any more questions and we hugged and uh, just you know really understood each other better and it was just the best possible outcome and so I've just been really reflecting on that and what happened, why it was such a notable interaction, how we got there. Um, so I just kind of wanted to elaborate on this interaction today. Um, and so I thought of three main things that came up as I've been reflecting on this 
conversation that seem really relevant to our practice. And, you know, not just to the vaccine thing, not just to uh, conversations around race, which we're talking about now in the study group here at Sweetwater and all over the country and the world, but really to any interaction that involves disagreement or conflict. Um, this was just a really good example of how things can go, or at least a, a slight example of, of how we can take disagreements um, as Buddha and as a way of growing closer, uh, closer to each other and closer to wisdom and compassion. So the three things that really came up as I've been reflecting are uh, not knowing, we talk about that a lot, uh, relationship and how to make a change in the world. And these three things, these three aspects of this interaction came up kind of like koans. Um, so, you know, none of these three things led to some kind of concrete aha moment or like, ah, this is how it should be, or this is what I need to say, or this is how I should view people. They're like koans in the sense that they're constantly alive, right? They're points of practice. They are constant gifts, gifts that keep on giving, uh, things to really live with and penetrate and um, flow with. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about these three things in that kind of context, uh, presenting different sides, uh, a vehicle to let go as opposed to a vehicle for grasping, getting something. So the first part, the first aspect of not knowing, uh, really came up because as soon as we started getting into this conversation, it was just so clear to me that there was this urge, this instinctual, reactionary, rehearsed drive to be like, I know what's real and what's better, and I need to make this person know as well. Um, that was the only, like, that, that instinct, that initial um, spark was to get this person to know what I know, because I know that I know the right thing. And in that moment, I was able to, you know, I'm sure we've all had this conversation a million times. And over the past year or so, every time I get into it, I'm just trying little by little to get better at it and to not just excommunicate everyone and get upset and stressed and anxious. Little by little, how do I do this better? Because this conversation, unfortunately, is not going away. And, you know, just, just disagreements in general are just going to be a part of our life. And so I just wanted to take the opportunity to just get a little bit better. How do I not just be a fact blowhard? Let me just ram all my facts down her throat so that she, you know, changes. And so I just kind of said to myself, what does not knowing look like right now? Instead of, I must impart what I know. And it was just a really good example because, you know, we talk about not knowing a lot in these Dharma talks and uh, in our practice in general. And it's really hard to capture the difference between the not knowing that we're talking about here in practice, the first tenet of the Zen peacemakers, um, really hard to grasp the difference between that not knowing and the kind of usual not knowing of just like, I don't know, right? Because the not knowing that I brought to this conversation wasn't, um, well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe she's right. Maybe there is an evil Illuminati running the big pharma and I just don't know. It wasn't that. I know that the vaccine is good and how we should all be taking it. Not knowing that I brought was more of just an overall general letting go of knowing. I'm right, she's right, this is wrong, 
that's wrong, that whole realm, just kind of leave that realm for a second. Forget about who knows what, forget about changing minds, forget about getting to the facts and just be present with her and look her in the eye and listen deeply and just, you know, for a better word, I'll just steal bear witness, just bear witness to what is going on and forget about right and wrong for a second. And that difference between just forgetting about right and wrong in general and the other not knowing, which is like, well, maybe I just don't know. Those are different. It's, it's subtle. Um, but I was able to bring my knowing, knowing that the vaccine is saving thousands and millions of lives and just setting it aside for a second, just to be present. And it's really the same spirit as that famous koan, uh, case 20 in the book of equanimity. I think we've talked about it a lot here. Uh, Jesus not knowing is the most intimate. Uh, Jesus talking with Hogan. And uh, he asks Hogan, uh, where are you pilgrimaging to? And Hogan said, don't know. And Jesus says, not knowing is the most intimate. And at that, Hogan experiences enlightenment. And I think that's the spirit of that koan. It's not necessarily, well, I don't know where I'm going. I guess I'll just follow the wind. It's more just kind of setting aside know my destination it's a very subtle difference and it's really hard to talk about but just in this moment with this woman it was just so helpful because that attitude of like must change this person's mind must get the facts out there it just eased into a let's be here together and for some reason, it just really changed the vibe of our conversation. And we were both really able to be with one another. And it just allowed, for me, it allowed her Buddhahood to shine through in what she was saying, whether it was about the evil government and how money is more important than, you know, all the, you know, uh, conspiracy things that she had been reading, I was just able to really be with her. And it made such a difference in the interaction. Um, and that's, you know, to say the reason why this is a con is because it's, it's really loose and it's really um, offers all the sides. And because um, I also was really aware of the importance of remembering that the point is, we should get vaccinated. I know that. And I'm strong. I'm confident about that. So going to a place of not knowing didn't necessarily um, attenuate or uh, put into question my confidence in that. I was just able to approach it and connect with this person in a different way. Uh, so the second part, the second aspect is relationship. Um, and this came up primarily because after we were talking for a while and it was clear that I was advocating for vaccines and she was not, at a certain point she kind of paused and she looked me in the eye and she said, are you going to block me now? Which uh, for those of you who don't know, like maybe it's millennial speak, block me means not be my friend anymore um, in a general sense. And it was just such a, just a sweet but more poignant kind of moment. Because you could tell that, you know, she's obviously feeling these things and she's getting ostracized and she almost lost her job. And I'm sure she's getting a lot of flack everywhere for being an anti-vaxxer. Uh, as we've seen in our own community, a lot of people are feeling very on edge from being excluded and abandoned because of their unfortunate anti-vaxxing views. And it was just such a, I really felt that pain when she said that, are you gonna block me now? And she said, um, it's just so unfortunate that people are cutting off relationships just because someone sees something differently. 
And that is just such a, it, it, it really is just such a life long practice looking at that because there is a wisdom to that, right? We talk about all the time how everyone, every last person is Buddha and how we are one with everyone and how picking and choosing, including the people in our lives is the cause of suffering. And so much of our practice is about letting go of that picking and choosing about total inclusivity, total oneness with absolutely everybody. So how can I cut people off for what they think? How is that being a bodhisattva? Uh, what does it look like? What does it feel like to really embrace and invite and call in everyone, absolutely everyone? Um, there's that aspect. But also in that moment when she said that, you know, she said, it's so unfortunate that people are losing relationships because of, you know, people seeing things differently. And at that moment, really what was alive was like, yeah, yeah, we should be. <laughs> um, we also need to make boundaries. Um, if, uh, if you're struggling with addiction and you have a friend who doesn't believe in addiction and thinks that you're just weak, and that you should be able to just have a glass of wine and not, you know, don't listen to whatever the AA people are saying. You want to cut that person off. Um, for those of us who have a spiritual or inner practice, uh, if we have a friend or family member who worships the almighty dollar and nothing else and material goods, and every time you see them, all they do is say, you know, I love you, man, but what's this, you know, weird Buddhism stuff you're doing? You know, you should get a better job and, you, you know, it's all about you need to get a bigger house. You know, we might want to cut that person off. We might want to make a boundary with that person. It's important to see that. Um, and as a good example, because I know that there's tons of examples of Buddhism, Buddhist literature about inclusion and everybody being Buddha, every moment being Buddha nature. But I really wanted to look for an example of how we make boundaries and how we maybe let go of relationships and say no to people. And there's a really nice um, koan in the Muman Khan, the Gateless Barrier. Uh, let's see, case 11, Joshu and the Hermits. So Joshu went to a hermit's cottage and asked, anybody in? Anybody in? And the hermit lifted up a fist. Joshu said, the water is too shallow for a ship to anchor. He left. Basically saying, that's a bad answer. Your views are wrong. I can't stay here. I can't fuck with you like that. Excuse my language. Then he goes to another hermit's cottage and he says, anybody in? Anybody in? And this hermit just held up a fist. And Joshu said, freely you give, freely you take away, freely you kill, freely you give life, and made a full bow. And that's obviously um, a huge approval to say all that. So one hermit did held up a fist and was wrong. And Joshu said, I'm out. And the other hermit held up a fist the same way, or not the same way, but held up a fist. And Joshu said, you got it. You get it. And, um, you know, it's important to kind of sit with this for ourselves, but just quickly, um, it's not necessary. You know, there, there are subtle things um, that we perceive and uh, sincerity and authenticity and whatever the reason may be um, that it's important uh, to choose or not, right? I, I think that Joshu uh, just for whatever reason felt a kind of confidence 
and sincerity from the second hermit. Whereas the first hermit, he sensed maybe it was just like trying to do a zeny thing, right? And so similarly, in this position with this woman, this anti-vaxxer woman, um, there are people who I've had conversations with who did the same thing, right? They held up a fist, so to speak, and said, I don't believe in the vax and anyone who, you know, kind of said the same things, but something about it was aggressive or something about it was, um, you know, uh, confrontational, um, intransigent, just, just not willing to, to listen. And so I say to myself, you know what, I think I may need to cut this person off. This is just not good for my life. It's not good for our relationship and it's not going anywhere. And then there's this woman at the showers on Friday who also held up a fist, who said the same thing. I don't believe in the vaccinations, I don't but for whatever reason, um, there was a, uh, a um, compassion and a warmth and an invitation to what she was saying that um, said it made me say, yeah, like I really shouldn't cut this person off. And I really do want to listen to this person. And I want to keep this conversation going with this person. Um, so really having that wisdom and patience and mindfulness to um, suss out our relationships within the context of knowing that everyone is Buddha. Uh, it's a very nuanced practice and very difficult. Um, so then the third aspect of this interaction I wanted to talk about was making a change. Sounds like there's someone outside my door. No. Um, making a change. I just noticed how urgently uh, when I started in this conversation with this woman, how badly I wanted to change her mind, right? It's almost like the desire for me to be the one to change her was more important than anything, than doing good for public health, for keeping connection and love between me and this person. There was this little aspect of like, what's wrong with me? I know the facts. I have to be able to know. I've, I've been having this conversation for a year, over a year. I have to find the way to change this person's mind. And as soon as I let go of that, right, I was able to really see that in the moment. And as soon as I let go of that, right, it's kind of related to the not knowing bit. Um, it really changed. It really did change the vibe. It changed me. It changed the way I spoke to her. It changed the way I listened to her. And it just changed the overall connection. Just letting go of having to make change. Again, um, I quote the Shin Shin Mei by Sung San. Uh, the way is not difficult. It simply dislikes picking and choosing. Uh, which, by the way, we got a Dharma talk on the Shin Shin Ming from Eric Wilkins, Jion Gok, uh, a few months ago, and he's going to be back next week. Uh, he was an awesome Dharma speaker, so we really hope that you guys come out. Anyway, that's next week. Um, so in one way, simply disliking, picking and choosing to really be intimate with that, to really embody that, we don't have to change anything, ever. That's what we mean by everything is perfect and complete, perfect, whole, complete, as it is. Everything as it is right now is Buddha nature. And in one way, that is a truth. That is a truism. And hours and hours and years and years of zazen, at least for me, I can really start to just scratch the surface on that reality that there is nothing to change and that very basic urge to change things. Um, 
even, you know, uh, to change the fact that I'm hungry and eat something. Um, it's delusion. Um, picking and choosing, choosing to be a person who is healthy and alive. That is a choice. That is a separation that I am a person in the world separate from other things that wants to be healthy. That is a delusion. That's what Buddha saw. And that's one side of it. Um, and so that being, you know, conjuring that, uh, being present with that, manifesting that in that moment, talking with this woman really helped our connection and really helped the interaction move forward in a loving way. And the beauty of that is that it's from that place of nothing to change, nothing to prefer, nothing to <clears throat> pick or choose. From that place that I can start to really see more clearly what there is to be changed, right? So to stop at just that absolute truth of total oneness, everything perfect, just as it is, everything Buddha, nothing to change, no preferences. But to stop there is half the battle. And every Buddhist text will tell you that that is not where to get stuck. To encounter the absolute is not yet enlightenment. We chant that every morning during Ango in the morning service. Um, and so from that place, how do I make a change? How do I alleviate suffering, right? Because in the absolute place, when nothing to prefer, nothing to pick or choose, the very concept of suffering is a delusion as well. There is no suffering. That's true too. And yet we see so much suffering in our relative reality. And so from that place of nothing to change, being able to truly better, 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 little by little, see how to make that change. And in the moment, I was really able to see that so much change happened not from me like slapping you over the head with some mind-blowing knowledge that just changes your mind in an instant. Right? That's great. That feels good when we can do that. Just totally blow someone's mind. And there's tons of koans. I think most koans kind of point to that example where a teacher just says one thing or does one thing or hits the guy with a stick and boom, totally awakened, totally enlightened. And, you know, if you can do that with your anti-vaxxer friends or with your you know, uh, racism doesn't exist, friends, you know, and you can just drop that big bomb that totally changes their mind. That's great. That's awesome. Good for you. Um, but I just noticed that I kind of was having this like obsession, this addiction, this like, I must be the person to, and it just, as I let go of that, and as we're able to have this much freer, much looser, much more, um, deep listening kind of conversation, it really became clear to me that just planting an invisible seed, which I think I was able to do, and then maybe she was able to do with me, I don't know, um, is a huge step. Even though they don't say, ah, now I see, or hmm, I'm going to take a look at that, you might be right. Even though you don't get any of that, I got the sense, and I could be wrong, um, but I got the sense that what I did say, if I was able to just share my feelings honestly, without trying to change her, I got the impression that there was just this little seed that maybe would sprout into something at a later date. And it made me realize how much that happens with me where someone says something or suggests something and I just let it go, 
right? I just kind of let it wash over me. I maybe think it's wrong or crazy or, you know, not relevant. And then days later or weeks later or years later, something will happen and it'll trigger the memory of that other thing that I said. And it's like, oh, that's what they were saying. Oh my God, that totally makes sense. And without the initial seed plant that I just totally dismissed, I may not have come to that realization later. Um, in fact, I have a story about our very own Abbot, Sason. Um, I'd say somewhere around 2010 or something, 2011, uh, Jitsu Joe was still a uh, practicing priest here. And we were talking about what it was like to practice at Sweetwater and with Sason. And she said, practicing with Sason is like you're in Dokusan and she slaps you in the face, but you have no idea. And then days later or weeks later, you look in the mirror and for some reason there's like this, you see this red mark on your face. <laughs> and I think she was getting at that, that kind of patience teaching, that patience change and how powerful that is to not necessarily impart some crazy knowledge that changes someone right away, but just to, just to hint, just throw it out there. Nothing imposing, nothing urgent. And then just let it simmer. Having faith that truth and awakening is what we are and that it will be revealed eventually. And just quickly, I'll just end with that, but there is a beautiful koan in uh, the uh, Denko Roku, also known as the transmitting of the light, which is the stories of all of our ancestors in the lineage and how they were awakened, which by the way, Sason, I do have your copies, my bad. <laughs> I still have them. Um, it's very long, I won't read the whole thing, but basically, uh, it's the story of Yoshan Weiyan. Um, goes to Shito Shichien, who is his teacher, uh, and he asks, um, I understand the teachings for the most part, but I hear in other places they point directly to their true natures and become this. Please explain that. And Shito, his teacher, says, this way won't do, not this way won't do, both this way and not this way won't do. At that point, Yao Shan doesn't get it. He's like, what? I don't really see. And so Shito says, you know what? I don't think this is right for you. Maybe you should go practice with someone else. So he goes to this other teacher that he's recommended and he says the same thing. I understand the teachings, but to really see and to really get my true self, I'm not quite seeing that. And my teacher said this thing about this way won't do and that way won't do and both this way and that way won't do. What is it? And so this new teacher says, uh, sometimes raising eyebrows and blinking is all right. Sometimes raising eyebrows and blinking is not all right. Which is basically the same thing. This way is not right, that way is not right, both this way and that way and not this way and not that way are not right. He's basically kind of saying the same thing. But this time, Yao Shang Wei and has this major enlightenment moment. And he says, so he has this enlightenment moment and he says, when I was with Shito, my first teacher, I didn't get it at all. And now I get it. And the new teacher says, because of this, since you see it now, you must guard it well, but your true master is still Shito. And that I think points to exactly what we're talking about here. That even though it was the second teacher who said the thing in a way that made Yao Shan Wen truly wake up and truly see it, this new teacher is saying, yeah, but that little seed that Shito planted a month ago, a year ago, five years ago, we don't know how long ago it was, 
that was the thing that allowed you to see this. So, you know, even though Chateau, the original teacher, didn't get that immediate gratification of like, ah, oh, my student now sees because of what I said, he's still the one responsible, right? So taking the me out of it, I don't need to be the one that changes this person's mind, really allow, at least in that moment for me, really allowed me to just truly speak my feelings and possibly plant the seed that sprouts into something later. So hopefully this does something to help us all with our future disagreements and disconnects with people. It's a really frustrating situation, especially around the vaccines. But um, onward we go. And hopefully uh, not just excommunicating everyone that disagrees, but also making good, strong boundaries when it's appropriate.